let's start. Hello and welcome to this next presentation on UI components for large amounts of data. Uh, I will show two examples using GWT, the Google Web Toolkit, but uh, the presentation will also be interesting for you if you don't have any idea about GWT at all before. So my name is Andreas Hubmer, and I'm happy to be here, you, here today with you. Uh, what is GWT? GWT is a framework to develop complex sim single page uh, web applications. It consists of a Java to JavaScript compiler. So the main advantage is that you only need one language. You compile it to JavaScript. You can use your IDE. You can use your unit test environment to also test your client side code in the same uh, style as you do test your server side code. And uh, there are two types of wire transport for GWT. One is called RPC, Remote Procedure Call, used to define plain data transfer objects which is sent between client and server. And the other one is the Request Factory, which is uh, more elaborated. There the client knows a lot about entities. He knows about uh, IDs, about versions of entities. And this allows the client to reduce the amount of data it needs to send to the server. Uh, GWT properly supports HTML5. And important if you use the request factory, this is taking a long time. It also supports uh, maps now between client and server. So, but now back uh, to our UI components. Let's assume that we have employees in our database. But we do not have only one employee. Uh, we do not have 10 employees, but we have thousands of employees. And so we want to make the user able to select one employee among those thousands of employees. So how can we do that? That's what I want to talk about today. So we have employees, and they have properties. An employee has a first name, it has a surname, it has a username, some gender, department, and a supervisor in our example case. In reality, some more properties. And let me show you first how it looks like such a table of employees. So, where is my cursor? It's going around somewhere. Yeah, there it is. So, here we have this table of employees, and what we want to be able, when we are looking for an employee, we want to browse through those employees. Uh, we want to go forward, fast forward. We want to define how many employees we see on one page. And we want to search. So let's say we enter some name. And let's look for myself. Yeah, there are many Andreas, and somewhere it's me. Yeah, here at first row. And I can do something with the employee. So, uh, we can search for text, we can search for some predefined values for the gender, and we can search for the supervisor using uh, the first name, there's this Lorenzo Hall, or using the last name, also finding this guy who supervises Andreas Webster. So how do we get there? Starting with that, what Squid provides. Uh, what does Squid provide? Let's move on. So uh, what Squid provides is a cell table. It's a tabular, tabular component that uh, allows you to display a table as we have seen it, but it's just a client-side component. So you can push some employees to a client and then display those employees, but there's no support for thousands of employees because, you, of course, you don't want to send all the thousands of employees to the client side. It has some paging component, and this is as well a client side paging component. So that is what we have, and what do we want? Actually, we want to get all those employees uh, that somehow match our uh, search value. We want to order that list by some field. And you want to limit the result 
So let's say we want to have the results 11 to 20 from all those employees. And we call those operations searching and filtering. By searching, I mean you enter some text, and then you filter by the text. Filtering is when you have some predefined values, this combo box for the gender, and then you filter along those values. You want to sort, and we have a pager so we can browse through those elements. And we want to be fast, of course, so we need to do that all in the database, not on the client side, not on the server side, but directly in the database. So what does the sequence of actions look like? Um, maybe now we have to look a bit more carefully because it's not that big. So we have some user that starts to load a page. And uh, in the browser, there runs the quit client, and this says to the server, well, let's do some initial fetch for that uh, table. Uh, and it provides the name of that table. It's just some identifier for this table because we have tables for employees and we have tables for other stuff in our database. Uh, the first call, we just do some plain select. We order the result, no more constraints. We get back the result from the database to our web server. And there we just create the response for the client. We create a table result and as a metadata which we call the initial result. When the client calls for the first time, we have to tell him, okay, uh, there are those captions for those uh, different columns, and this column is sortable, this column is not sortable, stuff like that. Or this column has those uh, filter values. And then the client is able to display the result to the user. When the user does uh, another call, he enters maybe some search data, some sort data, or he wants to page through the table. So we call it a successive fetch then, and we also send some criteria to the server, and we add that to our database query, so that we have some uh, where constraint on the query. And when we push back the data to the client, then we don't need the initial result anymore, we don't need the metadata because the client knows it already. So the client uh, updates the widget and the user sees the result. So uh, what does the client side need to know? It's a pretty dumb client side. Uh, it knows the number of columns it needs uh, to display. It knows the captions of those columns. They get internationalized somewhere. And it knows which roles uh, which columns are searchable, which columns are filterable, and which are sortable. And of course the data itself, which is just uh, some uh, list of list of strings you can think of. So uh, we have some kind of table definition for the client side, which is not more than that. We have the technical field name, so we can find together the client and the server side, and then we define the sortable, filterable, and searchable columns, and we have also some hidden columns. Those hidden columns uh, allow us to transport some data to the client, which the user shouldn't see, but we maybe want to use in some user action, maybe some additional IDs we want to be able to act on later on when the user clicks uh, the table raw. So uh, what does it look in code, uh, what we transport from the server to the client? We have this initial result. It consists uh, of the table definition we've just seen, and we send there the captions, the search values, um, because we store the search values so that when the user comes back to the table, the search values are restored from the last time he has visited the whole table. And we have uh, the filters that should be presented to the user. So in our case, the filters were the filters for the gender, male, female, or other. And uh, the table result consists of this initial result, which we send only the first time. And it consists of the table data itself, just some list of table rows. We transport the strings and uh, add some ID so that we are able to act on that uh, raw object. And we need to tell the client, OK, what column uh, do we sort for now? Uh, what is the sort order so that the client knows whether the error is ascending or descending for that column? And we tell the client, okay, we're on page number uh, 
10 with a page size of 10 and we see those elements from 11 to 20 of altogether 40,000. So the server side needs to know a bit more. Uh, we have again the technical field names to match uh, the client data. Uh, we need to do some mapping of search uh, filter and order values from the client to the database query. And then again, we need a mapping from the database result to the strings you want to display to the user. And additionally, what we do, but it's maybe not that important now for the example, we can also add uh, permissions so that we can say, okay, only if the user has some permission X, then uh, we show uh, this column to that user. And on the server side, the sequence looks like this. So we get in some request. And if it's the first request from the client, then it doesn't know all that metadata. We add the metadata to the result, the, the captions, uh, and the initial search of filter values. Then we create the database query. So we use the, uh, the filters or search values from the client if he has sent some. Uh, we execute that query with paging so that we only get 10 results back from the database, or 20, whatever page size the user has selected. And then we map those query results to our table raw object that the client uh, tabular component can interpret. And then we execute the nearly the same query again, but n uh, without the order and out without the paging, and we do just the count query so that we know how many results there are all together so that we can tell the user in this paging component, oh, there are 10,000 results for your query. And we set that metadata also on the result object and send the results back to the client. So the server side table definition looks like this. To be honest, in our case, it looks a bit different, but I've enhanced it for you to use Java 8 lambdas. So uh, we have some query creator that takes the search values and creates the query. Then we define the columns. We have, uh, again, the technical name here. And then we say, okay, when we map back the query results, we map one employee uh, for the first name column to e.getFirstName. And for the gender, we have some filter column uh, where we also have a mapping and where we additionally define the filter values, values that should be presented to the client. Here we have constant filter values. Uh, they mustn't be constant. We can also go to the database and say, okay, we, let's check all the values that are in the database for that column. So what I'm leaving out here now is internationalization. So you may want to internationalize uh, the value you get here. And we have, uh, again, this issue with permissions. Uh, where you can just add here some permissions and say only if the user has that permission, he will see that column at all. Uh, to improve usability, there are a few things you should consider when you do some uh, such uh, components. Of course, you want to use like queries. So when the user enters just the beginning of a name, you want to find all the users whose names start with that uh, letters. And uh, you want to use some uh, case insensitive collation in your database so uh, that it doesn't matter whether the user enters lowercase or uppercase letters. Uh, in this example, this is just uh, the way you do it in HyperSQL database. Uh, we define the collation as uh, English with uppercase comparison. This is what UCC means. So then inside the database, the comparison is done always on an uppercase basis. Uh, and this also is used in your index you probably should have. Well, uh, and also important for usability is that what the user enters uh, as a search value that is uh, the same as what he sees in your rendering. So the rendered string for the supervisor was first name plus last name. Uh, when the user sees that and then he sees some uh, text box to enter, uh, the supervisor's name, he expects that he can enter first name, space last name, and then we'll find some results. So if you enter just uh, one string without any spaces, then the query that you create should look like this. So if you search for and, then maybe the user wants to find somebody, some employee 
whose first name starts with and, like Andreas, or whose last name starts like and. But if the user enters a string like Andreas who, uh, then he wants to find users whose first name starts with Andreas and whose last name starts with who. So then the query looks different. Note that here we now have the end and we have different values uh, in the like comparison. So you should always search for that what you to display to the user. Uh, it gets more complicated when you allow middle names or things like that, um, but that is up to your imagination now how that would work out in the query. So then is the question, do you want to store state somehow? So what we wanted to do was that when the user comes back to the tabular component, then he um, has entered already the same search value he has, use, he has used the last time. So one option is to store that settings in the database on the server side. The advantage is the user can log in from different uh, uh, browsers. Uh, he can delete his cookies, whatever. You always have uh, your state available. Another option would be to use HTML5 storage, storage inside the browser, which is supported by GWT. Uh, or another option also easily usable in GWT uh, is that you use the history of your browser. Uh, GWT is a single page application, but it supports uh, history tokens. It's called uh, activities and places. And then you would just add uh, the search, uh, well, is the user had entered uh, to the URL and it will maybe look like this. So this was now how to select one employee among many employees using the tabular component. The second example is a suggest uh, box. So we have maybe just a small amount of screen space available to select one employee by first name and last name. So um, let's have a look what it looks like. So here we have the suggest box uh, for an employee and which it's an auto-completion feature so we start typing and then we get all those users that have uh, this string in their first or last name or it looks like this maybe yeah uh, or I just enter some last name uh, Craig is a first name let's use that stone and I enter stone and I find all those stones in my employee database. So, what do I have? Or I have some suggest box already provided by GWT. It's a text component, but again, it's only a client side component. So what it can do, you can put in a lot of strings and then it uh, provides suggestions, but you want, don't wanna put in 40,000 employees. So um, what you have to do is you have to write your own oracle. It's called a suggest oracle. Uh, this suggest oracle is given a query and then it give, gives back uh, a list of suggestions which are displayed in this uh, drop-down box, kind of drop-down box. So uh, what did we need to implement? It was an oracle, a remote oracle that does filtering, sorting and paging inside the database, quite similar to the uh, paging table, then we need a timer because we don't want to send a request to the server every time the user inserts some letter in the text box. So we wait 300 milliseconds uh, after the user has started, stopped typing and only then we send a request to the server. And then we do highlighting of course so that the user can see in the result, okay, I've entered that letters and I found that result now because here are those letters in the result. And just let me quickly show this uh, interface for the suggest oracle. Uh, consists of just, uh, actually it's an abstract class, that's why the class keyword is here. Uh, we have the method request suggestions. Uh, and what we get in is a request and we get a callback interface. So that's really neat because we are, uh, as you wanna go to the server, we have to be asynchronous. And with the callback interface, it's not difficult to be asynchronous. So we get a in request in with some query string and the amount of results the user wants to see. And when we found our, res uh, our results in the database, 
we sent back a response, which is just a collection of uh, strings, actually, differentiating between a display string and the actual string that should go uh, inside the text box after selection. So uh, just one note on performance. Um, as I said, for large amounts of data, you should make sure that you use indices in your database for all those fields that you allow the user to search for, to filter for, and even to order for, because otherwise it will start smoking. And um, maybe you find out that your count query gets too expensive, it takes too much time. In that case, uh, you just can say, well, I don't need to count. I do it like Gmail instead of telling the user there are 40,000 employees in total. I will just tell him, okay, you see employees number 11 to 20, and there exist more employees. So the user can just click forward and he will see, oh, okay, there are also 30 employees, 40 employees, and so on. So uh, we've started with a big amount of employees where we cannot distinguish those employees and cannot find the one we're looking for. And I've shown you two ways to access the data, to search your data, and to find the user, the employee you're looking for. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions. Yes? Uh, how do you handle the data changes uh, uh, when the user um, is scrolling between two pages and between not page 11 and the in between of this scrolling data was changed? How do you handle such changes in display? And so now you display more results or you just uh, can have some kind of cache? Okay, uh, the question was how I do handle changes to the underlying data. So let's say the user is on page 3 and then somebody in, some other user enters an employee, and then there is one more employee in total available in a database. As we don't use any cache for that, but always go to the database, uh, we will always get the updated results. So when the change has happened, and then the first user goes to the next page or do, does some other search, he will uh, find the updated uh, version of uh, the employee list. So we will see, okay, there's now one more employee, Maybe there's one more page in total, and you will get all the updates immediately. Any other questions? Yes. <laughs> question was whether uh, we handle or how we handle internationalization. Um, we thought about that. Initially, we wanted to do it on the client side, so we just wanted to send uh, internationalization keys to the client. Um, but then we didn't do that because Quid is quite good at that stuff. It um, um, does internationalization type safe, so you really have interfaces for internationalization, but that doesn't cooperate with sending key keys for your internationalization strings from the server to the client. So that's why we switched and uh, decided to do all the internationalization on the server side. So uh, we know what uh, language the user has chosen on the server side. And when we do that mapping, uh, as I've said, uh, at that moment we also uh, do internationalization. So instead of defining some static uh, string or directly using a string from the database in our mapping, we uh, put in some layer of internationalization. Uh, we are directly hitting the database. So we are not using it for any full text columns. It's uh, always uh, a search where we start at the first letter of uh, the column. So uh, if you want to support uh, searching in the middle of some strings, then you should think of that. Uh, 
uh, and you just enter the beginning of a name, you don't need uh, the full text index. Because you have your index on uh, exactly that column in the database. Thanks. Ooh, uh. Thanks break.